Ani, Bujo, Tanzi, Sega, welcome everyone. My name is Nochmoen Mushkogiyashk, better known as Philip Kote III. I belong to the Underwater Panther Clan and I'm also a band member of Moose Deer Point First Nations. Today I'm here to share with you a traditional land acknowledgement. Artworks TO, Toronto's Year of Public Art 2021, and the City of Toronto would like to acknowledge our presence on the land that has been the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee peoples since time immemorial. And in 1805, with the signing of the Toronto Purchase, is now the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. As we reach back to those first Torontonians, we remember our Mother Earth through the Seven Grandfather teachings, wisdom, bravery, respect, honesty, truth, humility, and love. The stories of each of these nations endure and continue to guide our thoughts and actions on this land. And as we acknowledge our Mother Earth, we acknowledge the Medicine Wheel and its teachings. We recognize the four directions, north, south, east, and west, and the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. It is these four seasons that represent the circle of life. Nindanoe Maganida, which means all my relations, which means we are all related. Aho, miigwech matakuyasu. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Rebecca Carbon. I'm principal and founder at Art Plus Public Unlimited and we've been working with the incredible Artworks TO team on several aspects of the Artworks TO program, including the Live at Five series. I'm excited to, back, to be back here with you for our eighth episode of the Artworks TO Talks series. This evening is our second of two talks titled Defining a Monument Landscape for the Future. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Stella Artois for supporting these talks. Stella Artois is Artworks TO's official beer sponsor uh, and wants to help Toronto's audiences make sure that they make time for the important things in life like art and good company, which is what we're sharing this evening, um, and make sure you enjoy your personal time after work. So um, we're kicking off this kind of five to nine with the Artworks TO talk this evening. Um, and thanks again to everyone for joining us. Artworks TO is a full year of public art programming unfolding across the city of Toronto that aims to greatly diversify the opportunities for artists and audiences to engage in art. Uh, we have over 1400 artists involved in this program and more than 300 new installations, uh, murals, screenings, performances, and events. Uh, kicked off the year last year um, in 2021, the last quarter of 2021, and we're really excited about everything that's happening in 2022. Over the year, Artworks TO Live at Five Talks is highlighting some of these projects, uh, among other amazing public art initiatives that take place around town this year and every, every year, the um, amazing work that artists are doing in Toronto. Next week, we'll be uh, announcing the launch of the inaugural Artworks TO Legacy Artist in Residence program, which will see an artist embedded in within the city department, bringing their creative forces to bear and exploring and highlighting key issues within that city department. So really excited to share that news with you next week. Um, this is a series uh, of talks about some overarching issues within public art practices today. We've loosely arranged it around the ideas of art and health, and we've been examining five themes over 10 events. So our conversations today have been really rich and inspiring, and I'm really pleased uh, that all are recorded and live online at the Artworks TO On Demand Library. So our hope is that these become a valuable resource for people interested in the various aspects uh, that intersect with uh, health and art in public. Over the course of the series, we've looked at um, art and emerging from the pandemic better, how artistic practices have adapted to public spaces within the pandemic, uh, community building and wellness through the arts, gathering, sharing experiences and the positive impact of this through arts, and then all access, how do questions about access and accessibility inform a conversation about how public art comes to be in, in a place, to what end and for whom. 
And tonight we're going into our second chapter, second of two chapters titled Defining a Monument Landscape for the Future. I'm really excited about the speakers we've assembled virtually today um, who are coming to speak about issues that set the stage for, an understand, for understanding the powerful dynamics at play in all practices of art in the public realm. In our first chapter on this topic, we heard from Toronto-based artist and Monument Lab fellow Quentin Versetti on a project that kicked off the year of public art. We invited Monument Lab to conduct an art-led engagement program that would ask Torontonians what's next for Toronto. And in this chapter tonight, we have Monument Lab co-founder and curatorial advisor Ken Lum talking about the learnings from that art-led engagement that will inform a report to City Council with reflections for action regarding future policy with respect to our city's existing and future monuments. And as we lead up to Ken, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Lindy Kinesh, uh, Kineshabeg and Esma Mahmoud, outstanding artists who are working with languages of monumental and monument in provocative, innovative, and exciting ways that they'll share with us tonight. Our moderator for chapters seven and eight is curator Maya Wilson-Sanchez. Maya was selected as one of four emerging curators for the Artworks TO Community Hubs program and has created over the course of the year an exquisite series of exhibitions, installations, and events whose concerns intersect and connect with our topic tonight. Maya's Artworks TO Hub has been made possible through our partners at Union Station, whose generosity and vision for supporting the role art and artists play in creating a vibrant urban space has shown true leadership in city building. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Maya Wilson-Sanchez is a curator and writer based in Toronto. Her essays, reviews, and exhibition texts can be found in various publications, including the Senses and Society Journal, Canadian Art, Contemporary HUM, the Journal of Visual Culture, C Magazine, and uh, the book Other Places, Reflections on Media Arts in Canada. She's worked in numerous galleries and museums, including the AGO, Gallery TPW, and the Textile Museum of Canada, and has curated exhibitions at X-Space Cultural Centre, the Royal Ontario Museum, and the Art Gallery of Guelph. In 2019, um, Maya was an editorial resident at Canadian Art and a curatorial resident at the Art Museum at U of T. The 2020 recipient of the Middlebrook Prize for Young Canadian Curators, she is currently curating the uh, exhibitions for Artworks TO Hub and teaching at OCAD University. And I'm going to hand it over to Maya to facilitate the conversation. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for inviting me to uh, moderate this amazing uh, panel. I'm so excited to be here in what feels like an incredibly timely conversation, not only within Toronto, but in other major cities in the world, as we think about public art, public, public space, and, and who gets to shape these spaces and, and, and um, take part in, in answering questions and, and designing these spaces for the future. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Lindy Kenoshemeg. Kenoshemeg is Odawa Nation Pike Clan from the Three Fires Confederacy on Wikwimikon uh, Unceded First Nation. After moving to Takrano for school and work experience, Lindy quickly found his love for the arts. His problem solving skills and positive attitude would bring many opportunities his way. From being a workshop facilitator, radio show host, powai dancer, production stage manager, Lindy strives to educate and bring down stereotypes of Indigenous peoples any chance he gets. He's currently the community engagement facilitator in the education and participation department at Young People's Theatre and the Indigenize Us program. So please take it away, Lindy. Thank you so much, Maya. <clears throat> and uh, hello to everyone listening and watching. Ani Bojo, Lindy Kinoshmeg, Dishnikaz, Wikwem Kong, Minwa Doganing, Donjuba, Ginoje Dodem. In my language, I just said hello. My name is Lindy Kinoshmeg. I'm from the Wakumakong Unceded First Nation on Manitoulin Island. I'm Odawa Nation from the Pike Clan. And that tells you everything you need to know about me as an Indigenous person, who I am, where I'm from, and my role in my community. And <clears throat> my community and my, uh, my nation and my role within my community play a big part in uh, all of my work right now. So design, when uh, I moved to Toronto, uh, I was finding out a lot more about you know, all the other nations in this area and collecting all of my own research about you know, learning about the, the agreements of this land and all the nations that occupied this land, those kind of things were important to me, you know, coming to Toronto from where I came from, Manitoulin Island, where, you know, it was only people from my nation there. 
And I think that played a, a huge role in the way that, you know, I've set up my program and uh, the way I design my workshops and facilitation. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's really built on, you know, building a relationship with uh, the people of the land and building a relationship with the land. Those are like two of the main important parts for me. And, you know, when uh, I began to my work of Indigenize Us at Young People's Theater, it was uh, to tackle the idea of, as an Indigenous person, when I'm working in a non-Indigenous space, I'm almost always teaching Indigenous 101, you know? Someone will be there who's like, wow, you're the first Indigenous person I've ever met. You know, do you guys still live in teepees? You know, that seems crazy for a lot of us to hear that question, but I have heard that question this year. And, you know, many other questions just like that. And so I thought, you know, somebody needs to raise some awareness. And so I just thought, well, know, why not me? Me and my partner, we designed this program, Indigenize Us. And it was a lot of the knowledge that we had gathered around our culture and our knowledge of the land and the language and art and history. And we kind of put it all together in this program called Indigenize Us, where we use a central theme around the seven grandfather teachings or seven ancestral teachings, which are respect, honesty, bravery, humility, love, truth, and wisdom. And we use each of those teachings, you know, as sort of a workshop theme. And we include a lot of interactive arts practices. So it's got to be something practical that people are doing. And the reason we felt that that was important because that's the way, you know, I learned my culture was doing, was by doing it, going out and learning these things, going out and learning the language, putting in the work. And it wasn't just, you know, a PowerPoint presentation or read out of a book. These were things that I spent face-to-face -face time with knowledge keepers and elders and cultural leaders to learn these things. And so that was really as central to this program. And it's become, you know, felt really strongly from those who have participated in it. It's created a lot of ripple effects with the people I work with in the way we work, how we work, you know, when I first started at the company, you know, it was questions along the lines of, you know, why do Indigenous people do smudging? Very basic questions. And then, you know, very shortly after it turned into, you know, how can we support this smudging within our organization better? And, you know, now it's more around, you know, what's, how can we think of compensation or building relationships differently than, you know, a, financial transaction. And so those are some of the ways that this program, Indigenize Us, has influenced, you know, not only the individuals within the organization, but, you know, all the way through to management and everybody else we work with around us. Uh, I'm working with other organizations as well within the sector. And uh, now I get to actually work with young people as well doing this program, which is very exciting because you know, it's not going to be me that changes the structure of the society that we're in today. It's going to be, you know, the grandkids of one of the youth I'm teaching today. It's going to be one of those future generations. And so, you know, that's where I see a lot of the work that I do through Indigenize Us, through, you know, working with young people and all of the different, you know, sharing Indigenous culture with everybody who's willing to listen. That's the way I see it affecting. Thank you so much, Lindy, for sharing your insights and, and, and we get to learn a little bit about your work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Esma Mahmoud and they're a Toronto-based African-Canadian artist. She holds a BFA from Western University and an MFA from OCAD University. Recently, Mahmoud has exhibited at the AGO, the ROM, the Museum of Fine Arts Montreal, and the University of Michigan's Institute for the Humanities Galleries. Her upcoming solo exhibitions include To Play in the Face of Certain Defeat, Traveling from Museum London to the Art Gallery of Hamilton, the Ottawa Art Gallery, 
the Winnipeg Art Gallery and the Art Gallery of Alberta. Current group exhibitions include Garmenting, Costume and Contemporary Art, curated by Dr. Alexander Schwartz at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City, and In These Fruits, curated by Edris Wahed, Yatina Farid Cook, and Aaron Todd. Please take it away, Asma. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to speak to, excuse me, to my piece, uh, The Brotherhood, Bracket Fubu. Um, originally, I was approached by Contact uh, Photo Festival to create some sort of billboard piece for, um, I believe it was probably 2020 at that time. And um, originally, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do, it was pre COVID. And um, my idea involved uh, photographing 100 men together. And um, as you know, with COVID, that just became impossible to do. So I kind of had to switch gears pretty quickly and try to create some sort of a billboard piece that I felt reflected the Black community. And a lot of what I was struggling with, you know, day to day in terms of representation is not seeing Black bodies represented how Black bodies want to be represented. It was like whenever I would see large images of, of Black people, it would be in ads that were for Calvin Klein or, or some white brand. It was never really like how Black people wanted to be seen. So um, I took the opportunity, I think we can put up the image now so people can understand what I'm referring to. I took the opportunity to um, fill this billboard space with two Black men um, who are both artists um, and who I know to do this very strange photo shoot. So essentially what we did was we brought these two people down into uh, Lake Ontario in um, late September, which was extremely, extremely cold and a very big mistake. Um, but outside of that, um, we had them uh, connected through, which you can see in the image um, is a two headed do rag. And I've been dealing with these motifs around do-rags for a while and this idea of ritual in the Black community. And so it was important for me to actually have these two people connected via the do-rags. Um, we are also working with Artworks TO and Contact to build a sculpture down um, just five minute walk from the billboard. Um, and actually much closer to the water that involves these two headed do-rags in, uh, in a black and bronze patina. So. Um, the importance for me with placing these bodies in, in, in water is because the water holds so many stories for our people. And to me, at the time, I was really investigating Black bodies in Canadian landscapes and why I was unable to, like, imagine Black bodies outside of labor um, in Canadian landscapes. And so I've been kind of working with that idea over the past probably three or four years, trying to understand and kind of reimagine what black bodies look like in Canadian landscapes without this idea of labor. Um, so that's kind of how this piece came to be. We shot in the very, very cold waters. The billboard's about, I don't know how uh, wide it is. I just know how long it is, but it's about 112 feet. So the scale, um, I really wanted to play with that. And I had, usually I photograph my subjects from behind um, because of the voyeurism that the viewer imposes on the subject. But with this scale change and to have the scale so large, I felt that it made more sense for the actual subjects to return the gaze back on the viewer. And no matter where you walk on that street, you will, those eyes follow you. And I think that was a really important aspect of utilizing scale and utilizing the black body in this way, how we'd like to be represented. So um, that's essentially how this work came to be with contact. Uh, we shot it in late September of 2020 and um, edited it by February, 2021. And, and it went up in May of 2021. So I believe it'll be there for two or three years and um, the sculpture which accompanies this um, will be unveiled I believe sometime this year. 
Thank you so much, Esma, for sharing about this amazing photograph. I've walked by it uh, many times and it's always so breathtaking and it takes up space and in such a meaningful way. So thank you so much for um, talking about it today. Thank you. Our next and last speaker is Ken Lum. Ken Lum was born and raised in Canada and he explores issues of identity, immigration, language, and spatial politics through a wide range of media, including painting, sculpture, performance, video, photography, and critical writing. His art is concerned with how meanings are assigned to images, texts, and objects based on cultural, racial, and social codes. He is widely exhibited, including Documenta 11 uh, other, and another numerous biennials. Lum is co-founder and founding editor of uh, Yushu Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art. He is also the project manager for the Short Century Independence and Liberation Movement in Africa, 1945 to 1994, and the co-curator of the Seven Jarha Biennial, um, Shanghai Modern, 1919 to 1945, and Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia. His given keynote addresses for the University's Art Association of Canada, the Sydney Biennial, the World Museum's Conference, and the inauguration of the Melly Space in Rotterdam in 2019. He is a Marilyn Jordan Taylor Penn Presidential Prof, uh, Professor and Chair of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know why I always cringe when I hear people give me my credentials. I think I'll shorten it next time. Anyways, um, I'm glad to be here. Um, Monia Rilla was invited to uh, by Art Plus Public uh, as a project uh, during um, a year of public art for Artworks uh, TO. And uh, we were in Toronto for about a week, uh, October 29th to um, November 3rd, uh, 2021, in, in various locations, including uh, Scarborough Town Center, uh, the Wexford uh, Business Improvement Area, uh, Cloverdale Common, or the Roundhouse Park, now Lastman Square, uh, up in North York, and also, um, of course, Nathanfield Square. Maybe we can get the first image first. And um, this is basically uh, uh, what we're really interested in, right? We, here's the, uh, ostensibly, in fact, it is the town square of uh, Toronto, really at the kind of logical intersection of, um, of, you know, a very dynamic downtown, the kind of hip areas to the, to the west and, and to the east now as well. As well. And at the crossroads of many uh, subway and transit interchanges, the largest mall in downtown Toronto, and so on, and yet it uh, speaks truth to power in the sense that it's a it's an empty slab, basically, em not empty in terms of people, but empty in terms of the various kinds of fenestrations and um, and uh, architectural features that that once uh, dotted this this area, and so that social differentiation that that what that which you cannot see here. Is, is what we're really interested in in, in Monument Lab, not just what is presented and apparent to you, but what you cannot see. So next image. And so what you can't see is, you know, this was uh, an area called the Ward or St. John's Ward. And uh, it's a very foundational part of the city, one of the first neighborhoods, certainly the first multi-ethnic neighborhood in, in, in Toronto, Jewish, um, uh, uh, Eastern European, uh, even uh, African Canadian, the first Chinatown, they're all based right here. And uh, that social dif differentiation became a kind of a problem in terms of urban, so called urban renewal. And, uh, and, it, and, and it needed to be cleaned up. It needed to, it was actually pathologized as, as unhealthy and so on. And of course, it's not just Toronto that um, committed these, these sorts of whole suites of, of neighborhoods. Of, the, of difference, but many, many cities um, throughout America and, and, and others in Canada as well. Okay, next image. And here's just a couple of images of, the, of uh, uh, people from the uh, St. John's Ward or the Ward uh, at, at that time of the 1920s. Okay, next. I wanted just to show this. This is an overlay of New York, the five boroughs in New York over Toronto. And it's quite kind of stunning uh, uh, impression because you know, New York is over 8 million people. And so the Toronto area is like maybe 2.3, 2.4 million. So it's almost three and a half times the population in the same area. In fact, you could say the Toronto area is actually slightly bigger than it, 
New York area. And I think that is a key kind of feature we learned in terms of our data collecting for uh, Monument Laval in Toronto. And, and it's about the sense of alienation, especially for people in the outer areas of, of Greater Toronto. Okay, next. And this is just a map of the uh, uh, GO train, right? And uh, it's all, all very concentric into uh, Union Station in downtown Toronto, but there really aren't any kind of connections between all the other uh, links. So to go from, let's say, um, uh, an area from uh, out, in the, uh, out, out, out in the suburbs or in the periphery of the borders of Toronto to, to, to another point outside uh, that's not within the uh, within the Union Square down, downtown is very, very difficult. There's no real cross route, although I know they're trying to build a cross train in Eglinton and, and, and so on, but that kind of infrastructure is not there. And so everything it becomes intensified in terms of kind of centralization. Okay, next. Oh, no, I'm missing some image here. Is there another image? No. Okay, there should be three more images. No? Okay, I'm not sure why. All right. Anyways, what I had was uh, I was showing the RAR line, a, a graph of uh, the RAR line or the RAR in, in Paris. And there you have uh, many kind of developed town centers over obviously centuries and so on, but you also have cross links between the various RAR lines. And so that does that creates some degree of decentralization in terms of um, in terms of the sense of uh, participation of the, of the suburbs um, and that they have their own kind of um, dynamic and so on. Um, to to the, to the data collected, the two of the most common responses, and I kind of jumbled some of them together was one, uh, for Toronto, was one was monuments that uplift. So monuments that uplift uh, African Canadians, First Nations, uh, people of color, and monuments to multiculturalism. I kind of combined those together. And um, because these were the, the highest in terms of uh, responses and monuments that bring different communities together. That was by far the number one um, category, you might say, uh, of, um, of responses. But close second, right? And there's nothing really close to, to number three, four, and five, and six. So, but a very close second was monuments that feature animals and wildlife and monuments that incorporate elements of nature. Um, uh, and that was uh, incredibly preferred over uh, a, a third and fourth and so on. So that that told us that um, that those types that nature was a or at least the, the the lack of nature, the lack of park space, lack of green space, or even the accessibility of those spaces, even if they're there, uh, it was a real problem in terms of the sense of people feeling estranged and alienated and so on. By contrast, in Philadelphia, there are lots of suggestions for monuments to better public schools, monuments to cleaner and safer streets, and so on. So in a sense, that's kind of good news in terms of Toronto because you didn't have so many um, advocating for that, but you did have this palpable sense of estrangement, which was, uh, and it was a kind of spatially derived estrangement that uh, came over and over again. Um, I'm not sure what happened to some of the other images, but we did a monument mobile, and that monument mobile was designed by um, Quentin Versetti, who obviously gave a talk here for, uh, 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 for uh, earlier. And uh, the, the idea of a mobile was very important because it would mean that the mo monument itself was a kind of move it constantly in flux and could be relocatable and uh, even provisional in the sense that you could change the designs of, uh, of the truck and so on. We thought that was really, really important. Uh, the, the idea of mobility and access and, and, and so on. Now, I'm kind of concluding here with uh, an image of the Liberty Village Prison uh, Chapel because it's, it's still in flux in terms of the, uh, you know, the lower western part of uh, Toronto, and yet it's, that whole area is incredibly important historically. Women's prison was there, all kinds of heinous crimes were, were uh, perpetrated there, to be honest, and also the a larger prison was also, also there, including um, a lot of reforms um, buildings for for poor kids, basically. There were basically poor houses, alms, alms houses, and so on. Then the next image, and there, now there are plans to turn it into a restaurant and, and so on. And I think that kind of odd 
um, indecision in terms of doing the right thing, which is just to preserve it historically, independently of, of thinking about it in terms of what restaurant could, could this building serve for people in, in, in this rapidly gentrified area is a real problem. And those are the types of problems that Monument Lab is, uh, is always kind of making observations about. Thanks a lot. Oh, um, I, uh, sorry, <laughs> I, I'm thrown off because <laughs> my PowerPoint is different. One thing we're really interested in, of course, is why are names and symbols of the city important? Well, because they are reflections of the discourse of power. They, they exude uh, uh, authority and they disallow uh, challenge to that authority. And names, but names and symbols, especially over time, become um, detached from the lived experience of its citizens. And, and that's the moment that we're in right now. And one of the, I think one of the uh, solutions might be to really kind of bring back the idea that the city isn't just an administered scientific panoptic and planned city, but one that's full of poetry, full of metaphors, full of um, similes and full of allusions. And that we do not um, uh, uh, unprivileged, let's say, uh, uh, we, we do not privilege scientific knowledge over local knowledge over oral knowledges and so on. And so metaphoric cities, the idea of a metaphor for a city, the question of what is Toronto, right? At any given moment. And, and, and to answer that, you'd have to premise it on the memory stories and personal relationships of that city or neighborhood, even at the kind of micro geographical level. And uh, that is a, I think one of the guidelines to point the way to a, to a better future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, for such an insightful and I think really informative presentation on Monument, Monument Lab's work um, recently here in Toronto. Um, and the thank you all so much for all of your presentations. Um, we do have some time to do a little bit of a conversation. Uh, and I prepared some questions for all of you ahead of time. And I think it actually connects to a lot of the things um, all of you brought up earlier today. Um, Right, so in the last handful of years, uh, there's been a time where it feels like we're collectively having a critical conversation in regards to our monuments, not only in the art world, but also in the media and politics and in activists and academic circles. We've seen all kinds of activations, interventions and protests led by artists and activists across the world. In Toronto especially, we've seen um, vandalism by Black Lives Matter into a number of monuments, including the King Edward statue, as well as last summer, the takedown of the Ryerson Egerton mon monument. And, and we see these kinds of actions happen all over the world and all over the continents. And I'm wondering, um, yeah, so I taught a class about monuments a few weeks ago where we talked about some of these things. And we discussed how this kind of upheaval and critical approach to our public monuments is not something new, but something that we see happening worldwide in an almost cyclical way during or after revolutions, wars, times of change and important paradigm shifts within our societies. I'd like to invite you all to reflect on why these conversations are happening now. What marks our time as a time to be having such discussions? And why is it important to do so, um, to do that work now as artists, educators, and community leaders? Sorry, I'm still muted. <laughs> um, I think a lot of this work was has been happening for a really long time. And it's only just now that a lot of this work is coming to light. There's a lot of work that people have been putting in from time to change a culture, to change this society that we live in. And I just feel like, I, you know, partly I feel like it's because of COVID that we've been able to communicate more through like the internet and social media. And, you know, the, even the fact that we're on Zoom right now and all we're all in different places, I feel like, these conversations and these movements have been happening, but it's just now, I don't like to use the P word, but I feel like it's now popular. And like, not to be that person, but like, I, I, I'm an observer and I, I watched, you know, the progression of like these takedown of these monuments. And um, 
sometimes I feel like, oh, no one cares anymore. It's like a fad. It's like, oh, we're going to care about this for five minutes and then we're going to move on. And so I guess to answer your question, I feel like it's been happening for a while and just a lot of these people have been, or a lot of these organizations or a lot of these um, communities that have been trying to bring awareness to all of this, it's just gone under the radar and it's, it's, it's sad. Well, I, I would say I, I would say that uh, you know history doesn't um, repeat itself and it does rhyme. So I, I do I do think that you know uh, monuments have always been taken down, but I don't agree with you that monuments have always been taken down for the same reasons. So I think like right now it's a very different set of set of reasons. Monuments at this moment, monuments have played a very important role in um, recalling or uh, embodying memories of a of a time when. Um, white privilege and power seem incontrovertible and secure. And as the world has become increasingly more um, uh, multiracial and, and multicultural um, with uh, regards to, you know, a nation's uh, population composition, um, and in part because, of, ironically, because of globalized capitalism processes that, you know, uh, reaffirm the logic of supply lines and and codependency in terms of supply chains and increased dependencies of trade and also tourism, right? Uh, there's been um, a kind of uh, acknowledgement because it's a it's a fact that the world out there is 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 made up of different types of people, made up of a lot of differences, and with that there has been a lot of pushback by those in power. I think that's what's been going on over the last. Wow, and that, that critical mass has kind of been reached historically in recent years only. And if you start thinking about historic in historical context, it's taken a long time, not too long, to even get to this point now. And so, um, and I think that's that's why this dialogue's happening. The, ha the dialogue's been happening um, uh, among people of difference for a long, long time. So it's not like anything new among people of difference. It's only been new in terms of those people in the middle classes and people with power. Yeah, uh, you both make great points and, you know, I don't have that much to add, but uh, I think I'm more in line with agreeing with how, you know, monuments and the way they've been taken down lately. It is a little bit, I think, around optics for institutions and, you know, um, organizations to, you know, be part of that popular trend of you know okay let's take it down let's change our name let's do this because you know we're being seen as this now let's do that but let's not change anything else about ourselves let's just change the uh the statue we have the monument we have um and you know as ken said you know keeps repeating itself so uh it's very hard to change this cycle because you know those who have been in power are still in power and they're still going to be in power for a long time Thank you all so much. And I'm wondering too, you know, if many of you say we need to go sort of beyond this kind of, you know, as you called it a fad. Lindy, you, you said, you know, it's sort of like something that happens on the surface when, you know, institutions change their name or monuments are taken down. I'm wondering then if we think of new monuments going up, how is that, uh, what kind of change does that provide in relationship to the monuments that have been taken down? I think it depends, to be honest, because a lot of these, what we believe to be positions of power are all just facades and tokenism. You know what I mean? It's like, sure, we'll take down our racist sculpture, which has been up for whatever many years. We'll replace it with a person of color who's, whose artwork we support. Like that's, it's a facade. It's not, there's no realized change within these institutions. So while at the same time, I'm like, I don't want to see these white guys anymore. I'm ready for them to come down. At the same time, I'm like, are we doing this? Be are we replacing these monuments with monuments of what our city looks like and who we represent? Or is it like, I, I find it hard to believe that there's real intent and a push to shift power, at least what I've seen with curators in these institutions 
who I've talked to who feel like they're being mobilized as shields in these institutions to deflect any sort of accountability for racism. It's like, no, we have a chief curator who's black. You can't say that we're racist. And it's just like, you put up a sculpture of a black person doesn't make you not racist. You put up a sculpture of an indigenous person doesn't make you not racist. So I feel like with these grand gestures also needs to be the work that goes in to decolonize these institutions, to decolonize, you know, the whole system. And I just feel like putting up some art and just being like, look, we're different. I'm not buying it. Well, I'm totally in concordance with what has <laughs> just said. Totally agreement. But I also think that one of the problems with monuments is uh, is historical. Right? We've we've kind of uh, have expectations in terms of what a monument should look like, how they should how they should perform, and so on. And so I think we could start with deconstructing. Uh, maybe we shouldn't uh, a deconstructing exercise so that we think about monuments as not having to satisfy all these historical and traditional uh, attributes that we make demands of. And that might be, so that is we, we redefine the monument, maybe not even call it a monument anymore would be useful. But I think in today's context, another problem in terms of the monuments that we do have is that there are so few countervailing monuments to, to um, you know, all kinds of other subjects that are worthy to, of commemoration, but are not. And they tend to be centered around downtown as well. I mean, I keep thinking like if you're in, I don't know, Etobicoke or whatever, Wexford, why, why shouldn't, why couldn't there be like 15 or 16 monuments there of all kinds of people that, the, or subjects or events that deserve to be uh, remembered, right? Because we do live in a very pluralized um, society and yet, and yet, um, you know, uh, it, it's not re reflected in the degree of social differentiation by the monuments that we do have. Well, not, what I mean by countervailing monuments is just to use maybe more uh, an American example, but certainly it applies to, uh, no, let's just use a Canadian example, right? In terms of like, how many monuments are there to uh, First Nations people? I mean, not mythical, right? That's done by white guys, but uh, real ones. How many uh, monuments are there to residential school desks or buildings or sites? I, if there's one piece, someone can maybe tell me, and so on. So those would be countervailing monuments. Those would be monuments to the crimes that were committed, and they aren't there. Yeah. yeah. And often those type of monuments, you know, they're they're centering the victims when you know we should be also centering um, the people who did the crimes, the oppressors. You know, those people should be named as well. Uh, I just want to add on really quick. And then we, you can jump in, Maya, but uh, just that thinking of things with an indigenous frame of mind, you know, why does it, why do we have to build more monuments that are taking up space? You know, we have this beautiful earth that we all live on and sustains us all. Why can't that be our monument? I really like what you said just now, Lindy, because I think it connects um, the previous talk that we did in this series where we talked about also, you know, can monuments be different materials? Do monuments have to be permanent? Can they be temporary? Can they be performances? Can they be ephemeral? Um, and I think that opens up this whole idea of like, why do we have monuments? Um, what work do they do for us? How do they function? And um, that actually leads to my next question. And, you know, as I think about monuments, um, I feel like you also have to think about public art, but also public space. And, uh, you know, I've been uh, curating for Artworks TO, Toronto's Year of Public Art for over a year now. And the first thing that I did when I got this job was put together a kind of working definition of public space for myself. And I felt like I had to do that because in Toronto, while we have these important sort of shifts in trying to introduce public art into public spaces. We also have this history of Toronto of public art being used um, to gentrify neighborhoods, for example, right? So I've been thinking about this quite critically and I wanted to ask you all, um, how do you each define a space that is truly public? And what kinds of changes do you think are necessary in order to create these spaces? I, uh, I think that they're, the Canadian government anyway has claimed to, you know, almost 
every piece of land and so is it actually public space or is it does it belong to somebody in the end and i have a I think I have a good perspective because I come from an unceded territory, meaning, you know, we never, never gave up our rights to our land. And so that land belongs to uh, the Anishinaabe people forever. You know, no Canadian government can claim that piece of land. But I think everywhere else where you go and, you know, you say it's public, you know, I don't, I don't know. I have a hard time feeling like it's my space when I go anywhere because I know it's you know, it's been claimed, even if it's been stolen. Sorry, I'm so bad with the mute situation. Um, I agree with Lindy, and I, I actually think maybe what we need to ask ourselves is, is it public for who? Because I don't, like, I understand that, like, and I know I keep talking about institutions, but um, I feel like you know, there are public institutions um, in Canada for the arts. And I feel like, yeah, they're public, but are they really public? You know what I mean? And who, like, who is actually able to walk these spaces unsurveilled, undisturbed? You know what I mean? And I just feel like it's hard to craft a public space that's for everyone. And I feel like, especially in Toronto, with all the gentrification, it's not a public space. It's a very particular demographic of people who they want to live downtown. Um, they pushed many, many, many communities out and bought land and built insanely large condos. And I just feel like this, the space isn't really public. Like when I think of Toronto, I don't go like, like what a public, you know what I mean? Like I kind of feel like it's a, and like, you know, not to use that word, but it's a bit segregated. It's like, you know, you got those people over there who can afford this lifestyle and are white. And then you got everyone else on the outskirts. And it just, it doesn't feel public to me, at least in Toronto. Yeah, I would say um, it's better to think about public sp space as a set of questions rather than to say, well, what is it? And then try to come up with an answer because public Public, I mean, the, the idea of a public is is highly conflicted today and highly um, contested, not just in terms of public art, right, which it has to, to try to satisfy so many of these these kind of conflicted spheres of the public, but it's contested in terms of public space, it's contested in terms of uh, what is the public good, right? What is even, what is public, what is good about public art, I think is, is a valid question public ownership, public representation, public interest, and, 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 and the public sphere. So on every level, the public is conflicted, right? And I think uh, it's useful and very uh, uh, educational for people to start having the tools to, to ask those questions. I think that's the way you get toward, towards democracy by asking those questions, like uh, Esme just asked, in terms of, well, how public is it, right? Maybe it's not that public. Right? And if you start asking questions like that as a set of questions, and then, um, then you start uh, actually getting towards an answer of um, creating more public, uh, uh, more, a truly more public dimension. I agree. And I think the last thing I'll bring up too is like this idea around psychic ownership and psychic ownership of spaces um, that people feel like they can't enter or they can't engage. And I feel like psychic ownership, especially in institutions that are publicly funded, but also privately funded, um, that psychic ownership makes a lot of people uncomfortable in that space, despite it being, you know, recognized as public, it's not actually public. Certain people feel like this is theirs. And um, I think that psychic ownership is a bit dangerous in, in public spaces. Yeah, you've all brought up some really interesting points. And you know, to, to think about Toronto, I completely agree. I think I've been thinking about public space in Toronto so much because of this project I'm a part of. And I also have come to a kind of conclusion, like, I'm not sure if there's any such thing as public space in Toronto. Going back to, you know, trying to think about these series of questions that Ken has brought up, right? Like even, um, you know, some people might say our parks are public, but then we see um, a lot of police 
involvement, surveillance, police violence in parks, um, even in the space like Union Station, which Artworks, you know, talks about as being a really public space. We have instances of people being arrested, you know, people, some people are loitering while others are, you know, there's so much control and surveillance, even in what we think of as the most public spaces and who gets to go into a space and feel comfortable. And I think going back to what you said as about psychic ownership, who gets to go to a space and feel comfortable, but also feel like they can engage with that space in their own way, I feel is so important. And I think, you know, going back to what Ken, uh, what Ken mentioned is, you know, asking these questions and thinking about building tools that we need to create these spaces or imagine these spaces, I'm wondering, can public art be a tool to create or imagine those spaces? And I'm not sure if any of you can think of ways that like public art can function in this way or even examples of public art where even if temporarily speaking, created um, spaces that are a bit more public as we might say. Well, I think, well, I think uh, a key question is um, for public art is and it's true for public space is what kind of um, a public is constituted by, by the proposed work, right? So I think it behooves the artist to start thinking about well, what, what is the public that's actually constituted by? Now, if you walk around downtown Toronto, which I know quite well, you'll see a lot of these kind of big, sometimes abstract, you'll see a big canoe, things like that. And I ask myself, well, who, who's the public for that? And, and who's the public that's constituted by that work? Right, and by and large, it's um, it's the public that uh, Esme <laughs> and uh, Lindia both kind of describe. It's, it's some people are, are more public than others in, by that definition, right? And uh, it's like the line: some people are more equal than others, and some people are more public than others, right? They 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 occupy the larger space of imagination of of the developer of the of the you know sponsor for for the work, right? And I think again, it's a it's a it's a forensic tool that, that um, people need to uh, exercise in terms of uh, answering that question, right? And, and making for better public art. But I also do think, linking it up to what I said earlier, you know, maybe, maybe artists should, in Vancouver, they, they have this program, maybe it still exists, where um, um, artists could propose a public work of art for a site, right? So it was not the site was predetermined, pre-given, but you, you had to come up with an idea, but you had to come up with an idea. You know what? This site needs this public art, needs my idea, right? And so on. And that, that in itself is, I, I'm not known any other city to do that, right? And so it is, is interesting, right? And um, because it allows for, you know, all kinds of historical memories on a very local level to take the form of a work of public art. Lindy Asma, I don't know if you want to add to that. I think that was well, well said. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. I think, you know, we have a few minutes left and I wanted to end um, thinking about the, the title of the series, this idea of monument landscape for the future. And I wanted to ask you all a question. So I'm trained as an art historian and I always think about the work I do as creating a history for the future, a kind of history that embodies our present moment but uses storytelling to imagine and shape a certain future. And I'm wondering if you can all share how your work imagines a monument landscape for the future. Is there an aspect of worlding or world making in your practice? Can start off. Uh, I think I said it in my presentation of, you know, I'm not going to be the one to change the society or make the major changes of the way we live in the world today. It's going to be the grandkids of one of the kids I'm teaching or, you know, one of those generations, three, four, five, even seven generations ahead. And, you know, I've only learned from my ancestors and my culture that uh, art is history, art is culture, art is storytelling. And the way you use it to pass those on, uh, you know, stands the test of time, you know? Indigenous people have survived 500 years of colonization here on Turtle Island. And we've done that through sharing our art, language, history, 
culture through our storytelling and our artwork. You know, it's all one. It's not one, you know, we don't paint a picture of a bird just because it's pretty. There's a story behind it. There's a, a lesson to be learned. There's language there to be told. Uh, all of that, I think, is in every single piece of Indigenous artwork. And so I bring that to the table with all of my workshops and all of my teachings uh, and everything I share with, you know, any audience I'm with or any youth I'm with. Uh, I want that to be part of, you know, how they pass on either what I've given them or anything they learn and what they pass on to the next generation. Well, I, I'm not trying to make a world. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out my position in the world, like who I am in the world. And I think that's what our artists, at least the way I define the purpose of art. And uh, I do it through my total oeuvre, meaning that everything I do, not just, um, uh, that is not just a series of work or the last show I have in the gallery or whatever, but my total oeuvre, I mean, that includes my, my writing, my curatorial projects, my, and so on. Right, and it's and for me, it's that it's that kind of sense of um, lack of satisfaction in terms of that agitates me in this world. I, I, there's a lot of things I hate about the world, right? But I and if I just dwelled on it, I I wouldn't be here. I'd probably be be somewhere <laughs> buried under dirt, right? And um, I mean that. And so the only way I can kind of try to survive in this world is to is to make what I feel very uncomfortable ab about in the world productive. To, and that's why, you know, I co-started Monument Lab with my colleague, uh, Paul Farber. And so because I was interested in these, these types of questions. And it's also why I've curated shows and they all happen to be about, uh, you know, historical shows, right? Pro project managing, you know, decolonization in Africa and things like that. So, uh, you know, foundational moments of uh, Chinese Republic and modernism and so on. There are questions I'm interested in. And so I'm not interested in creating a world for myself. That sounds too grandiose and like the master planner. I'm, I'm interested in trying to figure out, uh, you know, who I am. And uh, I've never been able to find a satisfying answer. So I just keep moving forward. Asma, did you have anything you wanted to add to this question? I think I, I've never really thought of making art as a way to make a like a new world. I think that, you know, and I've probably said this about a trillion times now in my practice now that I think about it, but forgive me if you've already heard me say this, but, you know, I, I really do believe that my duty as an artist and the duty of artists at large is to, it's our duty to reflect the times. And I think that that's what I decide to take on as an artist. I'm gonna reflect the times that I'm living in. I'm gonna try to create spaces for black people where when they see the work, they feel comfortable. And I think that, you know, that goes outside of just art making it. It goes with talking to institutions, talking to who you need to talk to about making these spaces more comfortable for people of color. And um, so for me, it's, it's, it's not really like, I don't, I don't think about it in terms of like otherworldly, but I, I think about it in the present, if that makes sense. So what are we going through right now? What, what do we need to talk about right now? And I know that a lot of this work will be dated, whatever, 10 years down the line, but I feel like for me, it's art is a marker of time. And it's a marker of, of culture and what we've gone through and like in the way that monuments live so do so does art and for the most part it lives for a long time so um yeah yeah thank you all for that i think i think all of your answers again push this idea of you know what do our present and future mo uh, monuments what their function can be what they can look like uh what place can they take in our society? And I think maybe all of you are talking about um, how the landscape, the monument landscape of the future includes redefining the time frame or lifespan of monument gestures. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering here in, in all of your experiences with monuments, thinking about monuments, you know, and in the case of Esma actually creating monuments or Ken in your work with Monument Lab, 
is the idea of a kind of permanence of monuments useful anymore? Well, I mean, historically, uh, monuments are, are basically, uh, you know, externalized memories. That's how we like to bestow a definition of, of uh, monuments and thus creating the confusion between monuments and uh, memorials, right? But monuments, as we know, are really um, the um, consequence of, a, of a, are really a means of a select group of people with power to, to, to define that uh, meaning for everyone else and to dictate what parts of, worth, of history are worth uh, remembering and, um, and commemorating, right? Now, I like to think that there will always be some events that are, that are, that affect, uh, are so huge that there does these merit some mem some um, uh, some sort of form to commemorate. I think you know, unfortunately, there's going to be huge catastrophes, all kinds of things like that. That does re require uh, a monument, right? So I think monuments will, will never go away in that sense, right? But I think outside of those catastrophic events and and so on, I do think uh, you know it's it's up for grabs. I think there. We need to rethink in terms of all kinds of radical possibilities for redefining uh, monuments, and um, and also to, as I mentioned earlier, to really um, um, you know uh, address the problem of the lack of com commemorative forms for all kinds of people. It's usually people of difference, people who have suffered, people who have been killed, people, who, and so on. And, and that in itself is, I think, is a, an important first step to uh, addressing the problem of monuments is, a, is to have countervailing monuments uh, to, um, and, and especially countervailing monuments in, in neighborhoods and, and, and so on. Thank you so much, Ken. I'm wondering, uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, Lindy, Asma, if, if any of you wanted to add. Any closing thoughts? I don't think monuments have to be permanent. I feel like, you know, if you think about every time we've needed to have a monument, like we'd have like so many, you know what I mean? Like there's so much that's happening all the time and so many things that we need to record as, as, as Ken was saying. So I feel like it's, to me, it's not about perm like it being permanent, more that it has impact and like makes I feel like it's about impact. It's not about it's not about it being permanent. And I feel like this idea of permanence is is quite colonial. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I have to say about that. Uh, well said, both of you agree. Um... You know, just in, term, in terms of how long you want to remember, how long you want to have those things up, you know, everything, all the buildings, concrete buildings, steel buildings that we have right now in whatever, two to 500 years, all those things could crumble and disappear and go back to the earth and be gone. But, you know, I think there's monuments that are still important. I think of like, you know, grave sites, you know, those are small monuments, right, to the people we love, so. Just how you think of them and how long they last is something to consider, but I don't have the answer. But, but I think there are, there are certain monuments, like a monument to reservation, uh, residential schools, monument to you know the attempt to genocide, uh, or genocide perpetrated on native uh, people. I think those monuments should should are permanent to the to to the extent that they should endure and until the point. In the future, if that point ever comes, when when indigenous peoples are treated as a human being, and so once that point arrives, then we can take down that monument. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for all of your insights, sharing so much. I think this contributes a lot to the current conversations around monuments, the function of monuments. What do we? Um, have to say about current monuments. How do we imagine monuments for the future? How do we plan for these things? Um, and, and especially, you know, when we think about public space and public art, who is all this for? 
and, and, and what do we want it to represent and say about ourselves or histories and even our futures. So thank you all so much uh, for joining us today for this talk. Um, the next talk is on June 8th at the same time, the same place at 5 p.m. And after that, the final talk uh, will be in July in person and there'll be more details about that coming soon. So thank you again for joining us tonight.